sacred sites. And she's a guardian of these sacred sites. So Dolores, if you will, we're happy to have you today. Thank you so much for blessing our orientation. Well, thank you first. Uh, my name is Dolores and Inu nation from uh, Machimekus Lake John. It's the community name. And I'm very uh, happy and honored to be here with you and uh, be able to speak and great and give thankful and be thankful for the for this day. And I'm honored to be here with all of you, wherever you are located. We normally do this blessing in a circle way mm -hmm. and um, I'm very happy to be here with you for the this orientation on the conventional biological diversity meeting and uh, for the Inno nation Papa Kassik is the master of the caribou is the supreme spirit from which spirituality and the for the Inu and for the Inu circular life emerge. So for us, uh, I know each one of you have your own way of uh, how you are praying, praying, praying. Um, but for us, uh, I'm carrying here my eagle feather, which was given by my, uh, an elder from my community, which gives me strength. <laughs> and uh, the caribou for us, it's our spiritual master from the, our ancestors. And uh, by sitting in a circle way, we all equal and we, uh, all in the same level and uh, we hope that this uh, meeting will go that way and the circular life of the Inu in connection with the caribou and its environment guides the activities and teachings and teachings as well as all of our work including the protection of this sacred sites and this sacred animal for us. Because the caribou brought us food, clothing, tools, webs for our shelters, snowshoes to move around, and the drum to connect with the spirit for dances and gatherings. Um, I just would like to say that the circular life of the Indo nation is a concept of talks considering the respect of overall integration of the four elements, spirituality, the, spirit, the physical, the emotional, and the mental. The circular life also considers all integrates the four seasons the four directions, the four races, as well as the four elements, including water, air, herd, and fire. And by living with this circular way, we acquire values, lifestyle, habits, and knowledge that are transmitted through everyday actions and also uh, demonstrates the respect that is the fundamental basis of our culture and everything that's surrounding us. It also bring us uh, the harmony and well-being of our lives. In the spirit of a sustainable biological development, uh, an indigenous protected area dedicated to the protection of sacred natural sites or life territories around the world. 
will therefore provide opportunities for reconciliation, healing, and strengthening our identities. And the, and the link that united us with the hurt, three actions that will lead the better well being, both at the level of individuals and to mother hurt. And I would like to, I'm very grateful to be here today. And I wish you a good meeting to all of you. And I hope my English was uh, understandable because this is my third English. I speak uh, Indo, my own mother tongue, French and English as well. And uh, I wish you a good meeting. Thank you from wherever you are. And uh, I'm very honored to be here with all of you today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dolores. Muchas for... gracias. Thank you so much, Dolores, for giving us a really wonderful start um, to today's program and also for the first three days of this journey um, that I hope all of us will learn a lot from. Good day to everyone. Uh, just to introduce myself, I'm Sefa, and um, I'm from the Kankanaay and Ibaloy uh, indigenous peoples from here in the Cordillera region, here in the Philippines. Um, I'm a member of the steering committee of the Global Youth Biodiversity Network, and I'm an honorary member of the ICCA Consortium. And uh, I just want to give a really warm welcome again to everyone who has joined um, for, today's, for today's orientation on the Convention on Biological Diversity. So uh, the sessions in the coming days are co-organized by two networks, the Global Youth Biodiversity Network and the ICSA Consortium. As you can see um, in the participants list, you can see where each, each one is from. And when we decided to co-organize these sessions, we felt that it made so much sense for these two communities to come together and share experiences and expertise. So we're very excited to finally have everyone here um, coming from all around the world, um, from very diverse backgrounds, very diverse generations, and many of whom come from indigenous peoples and local communities. And so we hope that everyone gains a lot from learning together and learning from each other during the coming days. So um, in the program, there will be some joint sessions that we will have together and some sessions that we will do separately between the between Gibbon and the ICCA consortium so that we can also have discussions within our respective networks. Um, we're also aware that in this group, there's a lot of experience um, both on the ground and in policy. And some of you might have a lot of experience with what we're about to be, tack be tackling. And so for those of you that do, we look forward to learning from you um, as well as from our resource speakers who we have lined up. So um, just to quickly introduce the Global Youth Biodiversity Network to everyone, uh, GYBN or GIBBEN is a youth-led network um, for, mob for the mobilization, empowerment, and action towards a life in harmony with nature. Um, and it's also, it also serves as the international coordination platform for youth participation in the Convention on Biological Diversity. So uh, since our beginning in 2010, we have grown now to become a global movement with um, 1.2 million members, uh, 550 member organizations, and 40 chapters, many of whom are represented here today. So we're really glad to have you here. And many of you are even a part of both uh, Given and the ICA Consortium. So very warm welcome to all of you. And um, as a network, we do empowerment and capacity building, advocacy and campaigning, and mobilization and actions for biodiversity. Um, so with that, I'll pass it back on to Ameli to introduce the ICA Consortium. Muchas gracias, Sefa. Thank you very much, Sefa. As Sefa said, it's so it just made so much sense for the ICCA Consortium to work together with Gibbon on this orientation session. There are a lot of things we'll do in common, as she said, and things that we'll do specific to each of our networks. But I think the mandate and the aims of both of our networks are so in line that it's just such a rich opportunity for us to interact together. 
So just a bit about the ICCA Consortium for those who are unfamiliar with it. The ICCA Consortium is an international organization dedicated to promoting appropriate recognition and support for territories and areas conserved by indigenous peoples and local communities, which we like to term territories of life. We currently have more than 150 members around the world in more than 80 countries and 350 honorary members. And as Sefa said, she is one of our honorary members, which we are very proud and happy to have as part of our network. And I'm sure there are others here who are also part of our ICA Consortium honorary members. So what we do at the, at the ICA Consortium is a wide breadth of things. We do a lot of work on specific themes, on defending territories of life, sustaining territories of life, and documenting territories of life. I would say that's the bulk of our work. But with that comes a lot of advocacy. We do a lot of peer learning. We do a lot of policy advocacy at the international level that has a direct impact on the local level. And of course, we create, we support partnerships and um, uh, for our members, and we also support alert network. One second, it seems like our translation in Spanish is sounding double. Thank you, Sarah. We will look into that and we will figure out what is happening with translation. Um, so for the for the ICA consortium's work, this is this would fall into the peer learning and partnership part of the work we do, and a lot of support and advocacy. To share a little bit about what we envision for this learning exchange is really to support each and every one of you to learn, prepare, advocate, and represent yourselves in the CBD process. So what we notice a lot is that for various reasons and challenges, a lot of people who work on the ground like you or youth or indigenous people or elders don't really have an opportunity to participate actively in the CBD process. So the intention here is to try and understand the process together, to learn from each other and to come up with strategies so that we are better able to influence and advocate at that level for ourselves. But primarily, I think as Sefa and I and Gibbon and ICA Consortium would all agree that there is such a richness of experience here in this virtual room that we've created, that the aim is really to learn and share and plan together, to learn from each other and plan with each other. So just a few final reminders before we move on. The chat is here. Please feel free to write any comments or questions or let us know about things like translation via the chat. We will try and resolve things as quickly as we can. Please raise your hand if you would like to speak. There's a raise your hand button there. If you have trouble finding us, again, let us know finding it and we will let you know. And everyone, please remember to speak slowly and clearly so that the interpreters can capture what you're saying. So Sefa, if you can take us through the three-day overview, that would be great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Ame. And uh, again, a big thank you to our interpreters who are helping, who, is help, who are helping us understand each other. Um, so the, this, is, this is just an overview of the three days that we'll be having. So this is the first of three days. Um, during this first day, we'll be having introductions, um, learning about biodiversity global environmental governance and have some discussions at the end. Um, day two, we will be learning more about how the CBD works and how to engage with it. And for day three, we'll be learning about the post-2020 global biodiversity framework and the upcoming meeting that's happening next week that many of us will be participating in. Um, and so for today, we're going to, after, very shortly, we're going to break out into different um, rooms for Gibbon and at the ICSA Consortium. We'll have two presentations from our resource speak speakers and then we have another session for discussion. So with that, um, I think this is our cue to move. Um, Mario will prepare, uh, will we'll, we'll prepare the breakout rooms 
basically the ICSA consortium members will be staying in the main room and then Given will be moving into one big breakout room. So I think anytime now you'll see a notification to join a breakout room and we'll see you there to introduce themselves. Um, we wanted to take this time to take a group photo before proceeding with the program. So um, yep, if everyone can just turn on their camera and quickly, yeah, so that we can quickly take some photos and then we'll proceed. So Mario, are you ready? <laughs> I'm ready, if you're ready. <laughs> So smile. <laughs> okay. Three, <laughs> two, one. And keep smiling because it's uh, it's a lot of you. So it's I have five pages here. <laughs> keep smiling. <laughs> okay. Okay, cool. Did you manage, Mario? Okay. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, yeah. Please, from for the people who came just came back from the breakout room, please remember to set your language if you're not, if you, if it's not set yet, um, and for interpretation. Okay. So, moving on with the program, Amiyali, I think. Yes, thank you, Sefa. I have uh, quite the honor of introducing Malina, who is not just an amazing person in general, but she's definitely one of my inspirations. So Malina is a Brazilian biologist and environmental justice advocate. She loves nature and she's been working for the environment and for nature as long as she's probably been alive. She is the co-founder of the Global Youth Biodiversity Network. She's the international youth coordinator to the Convention on Biological Diversity, and she coordinates Gibbons capacity building and empowerment programs. She has helped to establish this network, and it's now a vibrant youth movement with 1.2 million members from 145 countries, so quite an achievement. And just last year, she was awarded the Midori Prize for Biodiversity in recognition of her achievements. So thank you so much, Melina, for making time today to be with us. It is quite an honor to have you present to us today. Thank you so much, Yamiyali, for your very, very nice words. Um, I'm really happy to be here. Um, and I hope like we all can like learn a little bit more how we can advocate better in this process. I think that's why we are all here. I, I just I would like to give a little bit of a disclaimer for like the people that have joined um, previous given capacity building training. Some of the content is very similar, but we wanted to bring everybody on the same page so that we can start all together now. So like just there a little bit with me that some of the things we you have already heard. So today we're going to talk a little bit about the web of life. So everything that is living and bursting with life in this planet um, and that connects us together, right? And so in the given uh, group, breakout group, we were talking a little bit about how we fell in love with nature. And now I want you guys to remind yourselves of that discussion and think a little bit of what it is that you need to live, okay? What are all the things? Like, do you need like to be happy? Do you need love? Do you need like food? Do you need water? What it is that you need to leave? You can use the chat if you want to share with us. But for now, I want you guys to keep that in your mind. Okay. And then I want you guys to look at those photos and see if that evokes anything to you. So like, we talk a lot about how food is related to biodiversity, how like all the diversity of food and the plants and so on, and especially for the indigenous communities, you know so much more than the Western communities about that. Um, and how like from biodiversity, you can also find like the medicines, right? And all the herbs and everything that is helping us to, to take care of ourselves. Um, so a lot of people might say that medicine, you might remember that we live in an environment that provides us with services. 
So services like pollination, services like water purification or climate regulation. So those are all services that we need to leave, right? Um, but maybe a lot of you guys also thought about the more subjective things that you need, about like your spiritual connection, about the culture, about the dance, about the music, about the arts, um, and all these other things that are completely invaluable and immeasurable, right? And like this sort of sense of peace, a lot of you guys said that you get from nature and like also your languages, like and the connections with people and how that could be like something that you really need. And I think now in times of pandemics, I think we are missing that more and more and more. Um, so like my conclusion here, and this is something that is becoming new, okay, in this, in this world now, finally, like Western science has caught up that although everybody understands that we get a lot of like this provision um, elements from nature, like food, and water and shelter and fibers and medicines and so on like a lot of and the services like the pollination or the climate regulation one of the most important things for us be, from nature that comes from nature is this cultural link is how this connection between us nature and our culture forms our identity like helps us with purpose in life with like hopes with ambitions and this is what make human humans so i think like this is something that like western science um took a while to catch up like and this is because like biologists likes to just compartmentalize things perhaps and classify everything and so now i'm just going to give you a little bit of yes of that like western meaning of what biodiversity means which is all those living things on earth like it's all the insects the fungi the bacteria everything and how all of that is into this big web of life it's all interconnected and then like these are just some curious facts for you in terms of like the estimates of this diversity on earth which is huge and we don't know not even like like we know just a very small percentage of that, which is 1.76 million species. And we don't even know what are all the relationships between all these species, right? And so if you put all those species into a timeline, and this is what it is, it, it, it has to do with the history. So we are talking about billions of history of evolution, right? Of all those species coming together to form this web of life, to form this network that keeps all of us, right? So it's about not only like the species, but it's about the genetic material within them. So their genes, it's also about the ecosystems that are formed about them and all the like the biomes and where we live, basically. And for us now, since we have like this amazing um, partnership with ICCA Consortium, this is also where the biodiversity is. If we look nowadays, like um, a lot of the biodiversity, much of it, in fact, I think it's close to 65% is found in the land and waters that are managed, owned and under the control of indigenous people and local community. So those are what we are calling the territories of life and that's where our biodiversity is and that's why it's so important that the protagonism and the recognition of indigenous peoples and local communities are at the core of any conversation we do about biodiversity or about nature conservation okay so all of this web and all of this organisms this life this culture like interconnected is supporting our lives here in this planet, okay? And this is what biodiversity is in the end. However, we are in a very weird moment in our history. We are in this moment of history that human beings became so like powerful in a sense that they can change, alter the course of geological history. This is what the Anthropocene means. And as you can see here, is a bunch of statistics that is showing a dramatic increase from after the war, the Second World War, more or less. So it starts 
during the Industrial Revolution, and then it dramatic increases during after the war. And this is showing how humans is growing, not in terms of population, not only in terms of population, but in terms of production, extraction, consumption, and how they are affecting all the Earth systems. So the carbon dioxide, surface temperature, ocean acidification, like shrimp aquaculture. So like how our social processes, social economic processes are affecting the physical environment and how this is a heavy footprint, right? Um, and why is that? I think we all know, all of us here know it's about the more, more, more. We want more and more and more and more food and more energy and more materials are being processed in a global scale. They are being extracted in a global scale. And we wonder Can then, you, right? Yes? Can you speak just a little bit slower on the, sure. of the interpretation? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. So basically, this is what we are having. It's just more and more demand. But like the biggest concern here is that it's more and more, but not for everyone, right? We all know in this world that the distribution of both the benefits that comes from this exploitation and the bearing of the costs, so the impacts are being distributed very, very unequally. So this is the ecological footprint map. So you can see the greener the area in the map is means the less negative impact or the less resource you use in this world. And the red, the, the, the reddest you are, the more resources you're consuming. So you can see that like certain regions like Europe, North America, Japan, Australia, they are consuming like way more than the rest of the, the people of the world, right? And just so that that gets more illustrated, this is the list of like all the richest people in on earth by 2020. And basically they like this few people own more than more than half of the world's population. So we can see, and this list, you can um, follow this on Oxfam. They have a, an inequality report every year being uh, launched. And you can check that this list of the richest people on earth are um, diminishing. So you mean that there is less richer people, but they have more money. So you have a higher concentration of wealth going on, right? And then this, is shown in many different ways. And one of the ways that we can see the consequences is that like this global enterprise of production and extraction is like not destroying land only, but they are destroying the lives of the people and the cultures of the people in all those territories of life. So we are seeing a dramatic increase in like um, threats to environmental defenders, which are mostly indigenous peoples and local communities. So we are seeing the impacts at the people that are at the front lines. We are also seeing the impacts at all the rest of the species, not just us. Like, so IPES just launched in the global assessment that we like a, a close to 1 billion, 1 million species are at the risk of extinction, right? What else is happening? So like all those nature contributions, so all of those things that we talked about at the beginning, like the, the cultural services, like the food provision, all of that is at risk. So IPES has come up with an, a new conceptual framework that instead of calling ecosystem services or like natural capital or whatever other world they are trying to explain nature, they are talking about nature contributions to people, which are the three categories, which are the environmental processes, so the regulation of our environment, it's the materials and assistance, so like food, materials, medicine, energy, but it's also the non-material, it's about the learning, the inspiration, the psychological experiences, like supporting our identities and our beliefs. So all of these contributions that nature gives to us are in decline. So you can see that all the, the arrows here are going down, except three arrows, which is energy, food, and materials. 
So basically what we are doing in this Anthropocene is that we are transforming all this list of services and things that are important to us into three things, food, energy, and materials. And that is not even for everybody, it's just for a few people, right? So what world we are living? We are living in a big social ecological crisis. We are having like our lands being destroyed, our biodiversity being depleted, our oceans being like heated up, our climate change. We are facing a global pandemic and we are facing a global inequality crisis, right? So this is like a, a little bit of the picture of how we've been treating ourselves, how be, we've been treating like our planet and what can we do now? And I think that is why we are all here together. And I hope that by the end of this training, we can be a little bit more um, hopeful, not only hopeful, but like sure of what can we do to change this pathway, okay? And we will be talking a lot more about transformative change, but transformative change is what a lot of like the thinkers, but a lot of like the communities, a lot of the activists are calling for. It's about change, to, it's about a systemic, profound change towards sustainability, okay? So we understand now that the system is a problem, so we need to make sure we can find ways where we can start changing that system. And then how can we do this? right? We need to start addressing those root causes for the problem. So that is what we are calling the underlying drivers of biodiversity loss. This is a, a, a diagram from IPES Global Assessment uh, that we will share the link with you guys. I recommend you reading at least the executive summary because it gives a very interesting picture of what is going on, not only from a natural science perspective, but from a social science and from an indigenous and local perspective as well, because they are being like, they are trying. It's not easy for a Western world to integrate that, but they are trying to integrate and to start recognizing other knowledge systems. Okay, so here we can see that values and behaviors such as the inequality, the consumerism, you know, the profit over everything sort of values, they are driving demographic uh, factors, they are driving our economy, they are driving our technology, and those are putting a lot of pressure in all our ecosystems. Okay, so this is what is happening. And finally, scientists made a connection that it is to do with values and behavior and, and the inequality of it that is causing all of that. And then like at the IPES Global Assessment Report, they also start to scope how a transformative change could look like and what can we do, you know, to start changing like this trend of exploitation, never ending exploitation to something that is healthier for all of us. So the first thing that they said that is important is that we need to recognize diverse visions of good life. We need to see like, and take by example, like how communities around the world are living better and healthier in their environments than the modern like globalized society, okay? Um, we also need to address really rapidly the inequalities. We need to start asking those questions, who gains, who loses, who has access, who has the uh, rights, whose world vision matters, and start to understand how they are influencing this process and how we can change. Because inequality exacerbates biodiversity loss. Okay, it's at the core of it. And then loss of biodiversity will exacerbate inequality. So it's a two way thing. Also, we need to pursue justice and inclusion in conservation. And this is so important because remember, it's more than 76% of the world's biodiversity is in indigenous people and local community territories. So the way they manage, the way they have been doing for ages, so, like works and we need to recognize that we need to support that we need to understand more about that therefore we need to ensure their rights and their inclusion in the decision making process okay 
And I'm sure we're going to be talking much more about that. So I'm just going to go a bit quick because I think I'm running out of time. Um, another thing we need to think about is like sustainable and just technology because technology just per se, okay, without reflection, without like looking into equality issues, without looking into inclusion issues can be like, you know, just just another pressure for the environment. And this is exactly what Yves says. So technology is driving a lot of the destruction and a lot of the unsustainability. So if technology goes unchecked, like it's not gonna be a solution, it's not gonna be a pathway forward. So how technology can be just and sustainable so that it can truly bring us forward and not backwards and not create even more inequalities, right? And then lastly, I think is something that it was really interesting from IPES. They said unleashing values and actions and what, what unleashing values and actions means. So they found out like through research that people are actually good, ha, huh? like, wow. No? So people actually wants to do the right things. We want to be fair with other people. We want to be more sustainable. We want to do that. But can we do that? Do we have the social infrastructures to allow us to take those choices? Because for many of us, there is no such choice. I don't have money to buy organic food. I don't have money to like, you know, to pay more for all of that. And I, I'm sure all of you guys feel the same as well. It should not be a privilege, you know, to choose to do the right thing or to choose to do the fair thing, right? It should be the obvious. And this is exactly what IPES is pointing out. So if governments, in, uh, businesses, institutions start to build and develop and strengthen social infrastructure such as programs, policies, investments, this will help people like enable people to make a choice and people will naturally choose what is fair, right? So this is what they found out. And I think this is why we should also like um, work more collectively because like there is a lot of guilt. There's a lot of individual guilt, like, oh, like the world is in this situation because we, because you don't do things, right? And it's not like that, right? We need like those structure so that we can do better so we can choose better um so these are a couple of the things that are being pointed out as a way forward and i think like we will be discussing way more how these things will work and how this will be applied in the work that we are doing with governance here and i really hope that by the end of this training like in this journey we can start seeing okay how we can apply those very big very subjective in many ways like thoughts and ideas into our very like you know a specific work under advocacy in the CBD or in any other political forums that you guys are participating or at the national level. So how can I foster equality, inclusion, justice? How can I force sustainability? How can I start building social infrastructures like that helps people make better choices? Like at, 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 the, way, at, at the level that I am like active, like politically, right? And how can we do that together? So I think those are the questions that I'm leaving you with. Um, and I hope you guys will find, like we can find those answers, like us, a couple of them collectively this weekend. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Melina, for the presentation that really packs a lot of um, really important information. And I think that provides us a lot of great context for the content that's coming up in the next um, session in later today and also in the next sessions. So if anyone has any questions for Melina, you, uh, you can please drop them in the chat and uh, Melina can try to answer them in the chat or we will try to tackle them after the next um, presentation. Um, which, may, which brings me now to introducing our next speaker. Um, and we're very lucky to have her here today. Um, our next speaker is Jennifer Tauli Corpus. 
who comes from the Kankana ay Igorot people um, from Mountain Province here in the Philippines. Uh, she's a lawyer by profession and is currently Global Policy and Advocacy Lead for Niatero. She's passionate about um, developing capacities of the next generation of indigenous leaders, which, and um, we're grateful to her efforts to, to like um, train many up and coming indigenous leaders. Um, she's very passionate. She's um, very experienced with uh, within the CBD also, having been involved as a negotiator and expert um, for the International Indigenous Forum on Biodiversity or IAFB, representing indigenous peoples in the negotiations that led to the adoption of the Nagoya Protocol on Access and Benefit Sharing under the CBD. So without further ado, um, let me just see if you can share your screen, Jing. Um, if not, I'll share for you. Um, and let me try it now. I'm trying it. Okay. Okay. Hi, Jing. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Do you see it? It's a white screen right now, I think. Oh. Okay. I wonder what's wrong. Um, I'm changing the slides. Do you see it? So right now it's just plain white. Okay, should I, uh, let me stop sharing and then I'll try to share again. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, right. Um, okay, there you go. Yes, you can see it now. Okay, go ahead. Thank Perfect. You. Okay, thank you. All right, so I've been given this um, very big topic, and um, I thought that I would come right after an explanation of the Convention on Biological Diversity, but uh, I think we will manage. And um, I thank you for inviting me to, um, to join you and to share some of our experiences um, in acting, uh, well, in uh, being political actors within the UN system and particularly within the Convention on Biological Diversity. Okay, so it's a big topic, so bear with me. I have um, more than 30 slides, but uh, a lot of them are pictures and yes. Okay, so let's start with the United Nations. And um, okay, and it's a monster of a thing, the United Nations, and it's a very, very complex um, creature and um, as you can see here, it has made uh, six principal bodies, principal organs. And if you look closely up here in the General Assembly, there, um, there is the United Nations Environment Program, which is, I think, meeting this week or next week. Um, there's the UN Environmental Assembly. And this is basically the governance, um, the global governance structure when it comes to the, the environment. But of course, a lot of other um, agencies here within this structure are very relevant for work, for the work of political actors or for the work of indigenous peoples as political actors. But we focus here for the moment, UN environment. Okay, so if we have a closer look, in fact, there are many structures that have been developed within the United Nations since the adoption of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Um, and you can see here the boxes in yellow where um, uh, the UN has um, established specific bodies that deal with Indigenous peoples' rights. And they have come out with very, very important recommendations and findings in relation to the role of Indigenous peoples in global governance of the environment. Okay. So let us, as I said, let's focus on that uh, particular part of the UN that deals with the environment. And so we have here the different multilateral environmental agreements. And it's called multilateral because it's, um, uh, it's a global um, agreement that involves many different countries. Um, it also deals with the environment and 
um, agreements means that they are governed by treaties or um, conventions, which are basically uh, agreements um, arrived at by many different countries. So we can see that there has been a couple. And beginning in the 1970s, we've had many different agreements, conventions and treaties that deal with the environment. It started out in 1971 with the Ramsar Convention. And then in the 1990s, we saw uh, the adoption of the Framework Convention on Climate Change and on biodiversity. And all of these are responses to observed problems, exactly as Melina shared. Um, there have been issues arising um, that people have been noticing and that the global community felt moved enough um, to do something about. So um, because they noticed convent, uh, uh, sorry, problems around the decline of bird species and they found out that it was because their habitats were being degraded. Um, the countries came together and discussed um, the adoption of the Ramsar Convention on Wetlands. And it's the same story all around this circle. In the 1990s, um, the United Nations convened the Rio uh, Summit, the Rio Earth Summit, because of the recognition that there are problems with the Earth's climate, um, declining uh, number of species, so problems with biodiversity, and problems with um, desertification, where a lot of the, um, the Earth's lands are turning into deserts. Okay, and this is another infographic from um, Informea on the multilateral environmental agreements, this time grouping them according to theme. So you have climate and atmosphere, um, biodiversity, etc. And this is essentially the global governance structure when it comes to the environment. It is the UNEP, UN Environment, that coordinates everything. So they have an env uh, environmental management group that brings together the governance structures of all of these. So, and if we zoom in on the Convention on Biological Diversity, you can see that there are three um, objectives, and I think um, Melina already um, explained some of this, uh, these um, objectives. So it's basically conservation, sustainable use, and benefit sharing, okay? And there are ways that the CBD uh, implements the objectives. So um, this is the basic um, structure actually of most of the UN bodies that we saw in the first slide. Um, there is a an agreement and then there is a body that is attached, that is created by the agreement to serve as the general assembly or the highest decision-making body. So that's called the conference of the parties, which you see here in red in the mid middle. And then um, the conference of the parties or the general assembly of the agreement, um, of course, has to uh, divide the work. So they have subsidiary bodies. So one on implementation, and another one on uh, technical, scientific, and technological advice. And these subsidiary bodies set up even more uh, subsidiary bodies or uh, bodies under their um, supervision. Okay, so for now, we, we focus on um, this part of the mechanism here. Okay, so those who sign on to the agreement are called contracting parties. And um, the contracting parties have certain obligations under the convention. And one of them is, um, in, uh, well, they, obviously they come together as uh, the COP and they develop a strategy, okay? A strategy for implementing the objectives of the convention. And currently we are in the, I think the, uh, uh, 2010 to 2020 strategic plan of the CBD. And then once that strategic plan is in place, the parties have to develop their national strategies and action plans. 
okay, and part of the strategy, their action plans, is that they um, identify how they would contribute to meeting the overall strategy. Now, in order to further guide the, the parties, the members of um, the CBD, the strategic plan was broken down into targets, which we call the IG targets. Okay, and we see here that there are 20. And as you can see from the dates, 2010 to 2020, these targets were supposed to have um, expired last year, but because of the pandemic and, um, and a process was initiated to negotiate the pandemic, it has been postponed to this year. But these are basically the targets. Okay, you have the, um, okay. All right, sorry about that. My uh, internet was uh, unstable for a moment. Okay, so, and Melina uh, mentioned this, in order to prepare um, for the new set of targets and the new strategic plan, many studies were commissioned Okay, to identify exactly what the problem is. Okay, so that's uh, the direct and indirect drivers of change that cause biodiversity loss. And so this is from a global assessment by the IPES. Okay, you'll hear this a lot uh, later, but the, the, the main direct drivers are land and sea use change, exploitation of biodiversity, climate change, pollution and invasive alien species. Those are the main ones. And these are, um, I, this is, uh, okay. And these are the main items that um, the CBD now wants to address because they want to be very evidence-based and science-based, okay? And in the assessment, I'll go back a bit to the previous slide. There have been findings about how indigenous peoples contribute, have they, how indigenous peoples have contributed to the Aichi biodiversity targets. Okay, and it is around domestication of crops and animals, the creation and I guess the maintenance of ecosystems, protection against forest loss, um, conceptual contributions including um, introduction of alternative values and worldviews in relation to um, nature. <laughs> then we have sustainable use, management, and monitoring. Okay, and this is very important um, in determining exactly what our role is as indigenous peoples in um, the Biodiversity Convention and in uh, um, environmental governance in general. Okay, so let's move forward. So what is the role? Okay, now the big picture is that indigenous peoples are found all over the globe. Okay, and according to Landmark, which is an effort to map all indigenous peoples' lands, seven uh, se around 7.4% of global land is officially recognized as belonging to indigenous peoples and local communities. Okay. If you include unrecognized lands, it's about 12.4%. But the point of it, this slide is that there are indigenous peoples and local communities everywhere, all of the regions. Okay. And zooming in, and um, this is something that was created by a, an organization called the uh, Philippine Association for Intercultural Development, uh, or PAFID, and the, those from the ICCA will, will see that this is very familiar, but it's possible to zoom in on certain countries. No? And in the Philippines, using official data, we determined uh, forest cover, key biodiversity areas, protected areas, and ancestral domains or the indigenous territories. And the 
it conforms more or less to the global picture. Uh, it shows that indigenous territories are located where there is forest cover and biodiversity, okay? Which means that indigenous peoples have a very key role in environ global environmental governance. This is a recent study by Garnett on the global importance of indigenous peoples' lands. And he found, based on uh, language groupings, that 28.1% of global land is indigenous, uh, is um, owned or controlled or occupied by indigenous peoples. Okay, so that's the context. The other aspect is that a huge percentage, significant percentage of indigenous people's lands, you can see here on the left diagram, are protected areas. And compared to percentage of other lands that are protected areas, you don't see um, dark green um, uh, areas here. The darker the green, um, the more, uh, the bigger the percentage okay, of uh, those kinds of lands that are protected areas, okay? And percentage of protected areas that are on indigenous people's lands, you can see it's very, very intense, the green color. And your conclusion from this um, study would be that indeed, indeed indigenous people's lands have a very key role to play in relation to biodiversity uh, conservation, okay? And... Uh, Again, that is an, a different way of um, showing it, okay? So it's in all the regions, there are significant overlaps. And this is particularly important at th this juncture because um, currently in the Aichi targets, the goal is for protection of 17% of uh, land and 10% of sea. Now, um, for land, the target has almost been met. Okay, it's been partially met. Um, for the sea, it's not it not met. But now for the negotiations for the next strategic plan, um, there are proposals for uh, protection of 30%, right? And if you look at the maps that I have shown, there's no way that this 30% could be met without taking into consideration indigenous lands. All right, so, how have indigenous peoples been involved? Um, okay, this is um, one of the philosophies, um, well, uh, underlying the involvement of indigenous peoples, okay? This is Chief Oren Lyons of the Onondaga Nation. And when he observed the United Nations, he said that, um, I do not see a delegation of the four-footed, no, no seats for the eagles. We forget and we consider ourselves superior, meaning humans, but we are, after all, a mere part of creation, and we must consider to understand where we are, okay? And we stand somewhere between the mountain and the ant as part and parcel of creation, meaning that we have to reorient ourselves. We are not above nature. We are not above the four-footed or the eagles. We are part of it. And this is exactly what the 2050 vision of the um, Biodiversity Convention is about, living in harmony with nature. Okay, so as far as the CBD is concerned, uh, indigenous peoples participate as part of the International Indigenous Forum on Biodiversity. Okay, it is the caucus of all indigenous participants at CBD meetings, so it's an open, um, uh, entity. It's a, an open forum in a way, but it has no formal structure. Um, Co-chairs are selected for each of the meetings and um, there is funding usually through the voluntary fund and others. Okay, I think I'm running out of time, but bear with me. These are just a few more slides. Okay, and the IIFP was officially recognized by a COP decision in 2000 the year 2000 in Nairobi, which uh, by a decision that states that um, in, uh, it invites parties 
to support the IIFB in advising the Conference of the Parties. So the IIFB is recognized as an advisory body in relation to Indigenous peoples' issues. Okay, so, and since then, um, Indigenous peoples have participated actively in the work of the CBD. And this can be seen in the current assessments, well, former and current assessments, the Global Biodiversity Outlook 5 very specifically recognizes Indigenous peoples. However, because parties are not usually reporting on Indigenous, uh, on traditional knowledge indicators, um, the IIFB proposed that a companion publication be commissioned so that Indigenous peoples and local communities themselves can um, talk about how they have contributed to the CBD. So there has been a first edition of the local biodiversity outlooks and a second edition that was launched just last year. Okay. So it presents the perspectives and experiences of Indigenous peoples um, and their contributions. And some key messages around the spatial target that um, I've been focusing on in the past slides. Okay, while um, the 17%, the Aichi biodiversity targets in relation to protection are likely to be met, it has caused continuing conflict of indeed IPLCs, okay, including gross human rights violations as um, pointed out by Melina earlier. Okay. IPLCs govern at least 50% of the global land area and that a radical transformation in conservation policy is needed so that the approach is rights-based. Um, so in the race to achieve the targets, we have to make sure that we are not violating human rights. Okay, so those are the main findings. And these are just some pictures of the IIFB at work, and it includes uh, key members of the uh, Gibbon as well as the ICCA consortium. Okay, so there have been meetings set up with the co chairs, and you can see Sefa there behind. These are the co chairs of the post 2020 working group. And then you can see um, Indigenous representatives very hard at work. Um, these are just more pictures of those that participated in the last open-ended working group meeting and um, the plenary and the working groups that went on late into the night. If you, a lot of you were here actually, uh, and this was in Nairobi, the first meeting of the working group and part of our role as political actors is not just inside the plenary halls, it is also outside through demonstrations so that we can put more pressure on the negotiators. Okay, And in terms of the goals of Indigenous peoples as political actors, it's um, to gain recognition of our rights and claims for justice. We also aim to uh, work in solidarity with other nations and peoples and it's grounded on our interrelatedness in the web of life that supports us all as pointed out by Melina also in her earlier presentation okay more pictures and finally my last slide so what is our role as political actors if you recall from the slide that showed a quote from Oren Lyons one of our biggest roles is showing the way or as wayfinders, we show the way um, towards li living in harmony with nature through our own life ways, our spirituality, and our practices of reciprocity. Okay, And from the later pictures that I showed, we have a big role in shaping global and national policy through our advocacy within this um, policy processes and as negotiators. In the implementation, we also have a key role as shown in the LBO. 
So they must, in, uh, indigenous peoples and low IPLCs must be included in planning and implementation of the strategic plans. And the data that we are able to share and our role in monitoring, community-based monitoring, is also very important. And this, um, this data that we are able to generate um, would um, feed here into shaping global and national policy. So I hope I was able to identify some of the key ways. Well, first of all, the rationale for the need to involve us as political actors and some of the main pathways that we can take um, to um, enhance st and strengthen our role as political actors. So that is the end of my presentation. And um, again, thank you. and. I look forward to any questions. I will stop sharing now. Thank you so much, Jing, for that presentation. And um, this is one of the reasons really why we thought it was really valuable to have this, um, this kind of learning together, like with both youth and indigenous peoples, um, so that we can kind of be advocates for each other and um, be really good allies um, in the different arenas, whether that be on the ground or in policy. So um, we will take some questions, especially like while we have Jim here for a few for a few more minutes. So please, if you want to do ask an, ask, ask a question, please put it in the chat or you can raise your hand and unmute yourself to ask it yourself. Um, and again, thank you to our speakers, um, Melina and Jing. So questions can go to both of them and we're happy to answer anything. For the nitty gritty of the CBD, you can um, just, you can wait until tomorrow, but um, this, yeah. Any, anyone with, wants to ask, an, ask a question or you can just unmute yourself. Okay. Hola. Uh, just a second. Okay. Sí. Sí, me escuchan. Eh, si yo quisiera preguntarle a a Jim eh, por el el IIFB, si el Foro Indígena, si cree que o cómo ve ella eh, la participación que está teniendo este foro, si es suficiente para los objetivos que necesitamos como pueblos indígenas, y si no, ¿qué, qué recomienda o qué otras cosas podríamos hacer en, como pueblos indígenas y comunidades locales? Should I answer as the questions come? Um, yes. And maybe, okay, maybe you can just answer this one first and then you can answer the question from Albert because there's one question in the chat that maybe it will be helpful for everyone first. So Esmeralda is asking if you can define indigenous peoples, what are the main characteristics, you know, that defines them as indigenous peoples? And then you can go on to answer Albert's question. Thank you, Jing. Okay, thank you. Okay, that's a, it's always a difficult one. There, um, the stock answer is that there is no official um, definition um, globally. Of course, at the national level, uh, many countries have adopted laws that have specific um, uh, definitions of who indigenous peoples are. But basically, um, one is, um, when, uh, well, the working definition which is not an official definition uh, that we have at global level is um, uh, continuity with pre-colonial societies. Okay. Well, see, let me take a step back. The first, I um, the first um, subjective criteria, but very important nonetheless, is self-identification, self-ascription. 
So you have to be able, you have to identify yourself as Indigenous first. Then because it is a collective, um, you cannot just say by yourself that you are Indigenous and then you would um, already be Indigenous. There has to be a collective that identifies you as its member. Okay, and then the next is the continuity with pre-colonial societies, which means that there are still uh, existing structures, um, political, uh, economic, cultural, spiritual structures that are unique and that are um, that have continuity with the pre-colonial structures. Okay, so it's usually different from the main, the mainstream. Um, frequent, uh, usually there is a separate distinct language. Um, there is a unique relationship to the land and to the resources. Okay, like Chief Oren Lyons said, we don't regard ourselves as owners of lands. We don't have dominion over the lands and resources. Rather, we are governing it, uh, stewarding it, or uh, acting as guardians um, collectively over our lands and resources. Okay. And then finally, there is this determination to continue these, um, uh, these uh, practices and institutions. So that's what we have at the global level. I know it's not very, very precise, okay? but um, that's what we have. And the determination of who Indigenous peoples are would more accurately take place at national levels. All right. So about the question of Albert. Thank you very much. That's a very important question. I think the IIFB now is doing as much as it can, uh, given the resources that are available. Okay, um, and I think uh, in IPLCs are doing a good job at the national level um, I, by merely um, continuing to practice their traditional knowledge, their uh, indigenous practices, spirituality, that is a very, very important contribution. But at the national level, at the global level, as IIFB, I think there is a lot more that needs to be done and a lot, a lot more support that can be extended to the IIFB. For example, um, when coming to the meetings, uh, it's not enough you know, to, to just start reading the documents when you get to the meeting place. There has to be a lot of preparation beforehand. And I think this is one area where the IIFB is falling short. Okay, There isn't enough support to enable um, uh, analysis of the documents and preparation of um, positions before the Indigenous representatives get to the actual negotiation meeting. Um, a lot of the discussions are very political. And there are many, many different actors that um, have the resources to meet before the meeting. So for example, if you've heard of the different campaigns, Campaign for Nature, Global Deal for Nature, now you have the High Ambition Coalition, which are uh, a group of, uh, which is a group of 50 member states that are committing to the 30 by 30. And then of course you have the big environmental NGOs so it's important to be able to um, open dialogues with these uh, entities. And there are not much resources and technical expertise within the IIFP to do that outside of the meetings. Okay, So we're doing a very good job during the meetings. We're doing a very good job producing the local biodiversity outlooks. But we need more um, technical expertise and political, ex, uh, political resources to be able to engage all of these uh, important groupings. So that's, um, and well, of course, um, resources are always needed, no? Okay, so <laughs> yeah, I hope thank, that was satisfactory. Thank you so much, Jing. Um, unfortunately, we're running out of time. But I would like to ask Jing if it's okay that we compile all the questions that the, that people have and we can send them to you so that you can uh, answer them on your own time and then we can, so that also we can translate them um, if that's and, okay. Uh, and I can also spend some time um, looking through the questions on the chat and answering them. Okay. So thank yeah, you. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you so much, Jing. Um, so. 
now next on the program is that we are going to have another breakout room so some of the the stuff in the chat will still stay there during so you can still answer them but we are going to split again into the different groups um, and so please prepare for that and remember to rename yourself if you haven't already if you're part if you're here as part of ICCA consortium, please, rena please, please put ICCA before your name. And if you're here um, uh, as part of the Global Youth Biodiversity Network, please put GYBN before your name so that we can group everyone accordingly. Um, thank you. Mario, are you there? And can you take us to the uh, 